and we're live uh, hi everyone um welcome to i think which is now our fifth episode of life after islam ser series um and today we have umayma with us who will in be introducing herself in a bit um just to bring you back to what life after islam is i'll be interviewing ex-muslims from different backgrounds from different variety of lives and um activists or not um, the idea is to put their voices out there, to draw similarities, and to basically just have a chat and see how other people are doing after having left Islam. Um, I think a lot of the young Muslims who are doubting and want to leave Islam are always a little hesitant because they don't know what it looks like. And like they don't know what the outcome is. A lot of times we're ostracized and shunned away. But Umayma is going to give us a little more of a background on where she has been because she's had recent developments. And that would be really interesting and very um, helpful and comforting for a lot of those who are um, doubting and don't know where to go with that. So without any delay, Umayma, please introduce yourself. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, so I guess an overview of my story and you know how I got here, I guess, is um, so I'm an Egyptian born Australian in my mid 20s and um, left Islam about four years ago. Um, so my family ha had been practicing a pretty conservative form of Islam and um, I started doubting throughout my teenage years. Um, it was doubts from sort of the big picture questions regarding like fate and heaven and hell, um, ranging all the way to, I guess, the, the smaller details, like some of the um, little rituals or rules that just seemed completely arbitrary and just completely illogical to hinge our eternal life based on. Yeah. Um, so because of, did you want to say something? Yeah, no, I was going to ask, you said a very conservative family. What what sect was that? So it's um, Sunni and yeah. then Salafi um, okay. branch of Sunni. So pretty, so really, really strict. I guess the ones who also hate Shias, which is the real yes. Muslims. There's a lot of that propaganda growing yeah. up. Um, yeah, my dad considered Shias to be apostates. Yeah. Um, so, like, wouldn't get into heaven. And even there was some, I don't know the details because I was, like, pretty young and blocked a lot of it out, but there was some pretty, yeah, violent notions around, I guess, relations between Sunnis and Shias and it's, yeah, okay could never yeah. understand that but that was one of many troubling things that came yeah. up yeah so just added it to the list and moved yeah. on um but yeah like even through the process of having those doubts like it's not like it was ever something that I considered to be legitimate for a mm -hmm. really long time because of all the, the the shame and the guilt around the very act of doubting um yeah it was something that I tried everything to yeah. eliminate from from my psyche. So I was um, suppressing those doubts and, you know, telling myself that it would all make sense once I was older. And then when that didn't work, I was telling myself that I just was really weak in faith and needed to be close to God. So um, I worked. So did you have, more. I was going to say, did you have a phase where you went more religious for a bit? And then you're like, what's happening? Yeah. So when I left, I'd actually, I was at the point where I'd exhausted all of my yeah. options. I was at my most religious point. Mm -hmm. And that's why I felt comfortable enough, I guess, at that point to leave. Because I thought, like, I've given this every possible chance to make sense and, and to work for me as an individual. And it, it just isn't. Um, yeah. You know, so like I, I really tried to educate myself. I tried to surround myself with friends who were really devout so that I'd get that spiritual reinforcement. Um, I even went like to Omrah. Um, yeah. You know, I encouraged the whole family to go on a pilgrimage to 
you know, I guess see where it all began, you know, hoping that would result in some sort of epiphany um, and some sort of awakening. And how and, did that come out for you versus your family? Um, the Umrah or? Yeah, the Umrah. So like you coming back, did that mm -hmm. actually lighten you up? Because I feel like you have this few days of you're so religious and then after that you're like, hang on. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think like it was a very moving experience just because you're with so many other people, like hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in one place and everyone's so overwhelmed by emotion and um, it, you do get caught up, I guess, yeah. in that hype. So I think in the first few weeks afterwards, I felt like, okay, maybe that was something. And while I was there, I worshipped a lot. Like, yeah. you know, it was it was everything that I did. And I was constantly praying the whole time for guidance. And, you know, I wanted to make that, like, I wanted to make it work. Yeah. Um, so it's it was sort of, I think, the next year that it took to dawn on me that I'd now tried everything. Um, I tried to connect on that spiritual level and at least maintain that emotional um, connection with God and that was it um, so I, I made that decision to leave and it was a huge relief and massively overwhelming at the same time yeah and I guess before we just go into I guess the very start of how you were raised um, I've always noticed that a lot of people are always um, asking if the whole journey or just leaving Islam was worth it you know, with a lot of the trauma that it comes with, um, our families, but also like an abandonment of your identity because I feel like at the moment, me and like, I'm constantly rebuilding that identity and I'm like, who am I outside of all of this? So, and, and it is very like difficult. And also there's a lot of confusion, especially like when you're newly out of it. Was it, I guess in your words, was it worth it? Um, it was absolutely worth it, like literally just every second, because at the end of the day, like there's nothing like more valuable than just being able to reclaim your freedoms and let your inner self out. And I think that's why I think I, like my experience is a bit different with the whole identity Mm -hmm. crisis thing I I didn't feel like I lost an identity I felt like I was letting go of one that I'd been coerced into in the first mm -hmm. place um you know that that Muslim identity was so restrictive and so defined for yeah. us that it always felt like I was trying to fit into a box that um demanded me to um yeah, like I guess restrain yourself, restrain myself, and just like sort of completely deny my my sense of self, and it was just a huge relief um, to like just to have the, the freedom to work out what your identity is is something that I hope I never take for granted. Yeah, and it gets confusing, but I just feel like I'm part, like I'm just human now, like I'm just like everyone else, just constantly figuring out what I believe and who I am. And that's what like the human race is. So yeah. like that's part of what makes us compassionate. That's what part that's part of what makes us understanding and empathetic towards others is that, you know, we're all going through that. Yeah. Um, and in some ways, like I think I found I found it a lot harder to connect with people when I was trying to assume that Muslim identity because it gives you that feeling of, well, I've already got it all figured out. You know, I'm superior, I'm morally um you know above everyone else yeah. and yeah you just yeah and and I guess this goes back into how you were raised in terms of like as a child and what you were told because I feel like a lot of us were told Muslims are the right people and everybody else like might go like will go to hell although in my case it was more like just don't have too many non-Muslim friends because they might deviate you from the path and I never understood what that path was. I was like, what path? Like, I'm a Muslim. I, I never, I guess from a young age, I never had this bigger purpose that I was fulfilling as a Muslim. 
And that's right. why for me, the identity came into uh, more around like, you know, what is, what is, what does my name represent or like, who am I to my family? Who am I to the world? And that my bigger purpose had never changed because I was never given one from Islam. But yeah. tell me, tell me a little more about like the way you were raised and um, how your family, I guess, told you about the whole morally superior than you know everybody else um, fit in. Because it's always interesting to see that you know we're fed so much, but then when you actually meet people, like gay people. And I was just like, oh, okay, so you're not a bad person. Like, <laughs> so I'm like, but, but my religion still says you're going to hell. And that was very mm. confusing for me or very yeah. heartbreaking rather. Exactly. And not just going to hell, but you de you're deserving of it because yeah. you're corrupt and dirty and yeah. um, less than. There's such a, yeah, a toxic narrative around that to make hell seem like a, a, justifi yeah. a justifiable punishment um but yeah so in terms of like there was a like a very strong sense of identity that was imprinted on us as children so it was um molded around the prophet muhammad and his companions as sort of the purest representations of what a muslim was created to be um and that basically informed every aspect of our existence. Um, it defined, well, yeah, it, it prescribed how I looked, how I spoke, how I thought and how I felt about everything and d defined my purpose, my goals, and like ultimately what choices were available to me. Um, so um, I, was definitely aware like even from a young age that there were quite rigid expectations at play and that also had a sense um obviously it was sort of that childlike mixed with that childlike innocence but I, I remember that that feeling of knowing that my personal preferences or my feelings about um a, a particular issue just didn't weren't going to be accommodated it wasn't negotiable it was simply this is how it is and this is how it needs to be and um this is because this is what you were created to do end of end of and and did you ever express how differently you felt or were you too scared for it i think when i was younger um i i was definitely unapologetically myself mm -hmm. so i was very strong-willed, very opinionated, very loud, um, mm -hmm. you know, stubborn, pretty obnoxious at times, <laughs> just, you know, just, yeah, just being a kid really. Um, and I think that there were definitely signs early on that aspects of my personality were going to have to be restrained or, you know, um, yeah, moderated to fit in with, particularly how a woman in Islam needed to be um, presented to the outside world. And um, yeah, I, I did, like, as I grew older, I felt that pressure to conform to that ideal persona. And um, I think that was the first time that I felt that sense of failure that comes with religious indoctrination when I sort of realised that I really wanted to hold on to my sense of individuality and who I really was and the fact that I wasn't willing to sacrifice that for Islam when I'd been taught that my purpose was to sacrifice everything for Islam was and, something that I felt really bad about. Yeah, and did this overlap with wearing hijab as well? Yeah, I think that's the, the probably the biggest um, and most obvious manifestation of that whole struggle um like I just had an instinctive repulsion to it like it was just something like I never had that sense of oh my mum wears it so it must be fun and nice and you know I want to be just like her like I just found it hot and bothersome and like I just I just didn't get it like and I guess as a kid you're not really meant to yeah how old were um, you 
Well, I wasn't wearing it full time until I was about like 11 or 12. Mm-hmm. But um, it was always like when you go to the mosque or visiting um, Muslim friends and family, I'd be encouraged to wear it. And sort of as I grew older, it was non-negotiable to wear it um, sort of in those Islamic settings. And like I remember one aid, like we went to a park. Um, so for anyone that doesn't know, that's a big Muslim celebration. Um, mm-hmm. So we'd often go pray in the park, like a whole sort of big community. And um, we'd go play on the, like, the equipment. So I was young enough to be playing on swings and mm-hmm. like a slide and stuff. And I was wearing a hijab and like, I just remember like begging to take it off. And my cousins um, who were a bit more liberal, well, significantly more liberal than my family had taken it off. Their kids had taken it off. And um, yeah, I had to, to keep wearing it. And it was just part of that. Um, it's like breaking in a shoe yeah. that giving you and- um, blisters. I feel like yeah. my parents viewed it. And with your cousins wearing it or them taking it off at that point, how, like, did you ever use that as a negotiation tactic with your family? Like, they're not wearing it. Why do I have to wear it? Um, my parents were always really transparent about the reason that they were doing everything. Yeah. So it was always like, this is the doctrine. You're doing it because Allah wants you to, you, or this is the way that you show that you're a good Muslim. Um, a good Muslim woman this is what's expected of a good Muslim woman and um, you, like it's just you you can't not do it yeah. it just wasn't an option and um, you know like I did resist a lot like I it, the message didn't get through to me in those younger years like I was just like I remember so many um, so many occasions where I'd be trying to negotiate exactly like that and saying, oh, no one else my age is going to be wearing it or, um, you know, be going to a wedding and I'd be like wearing long sleeves, a long skirt and, and a hijab. And it was just like, I just felt so restricted by it. Yeah. Um, and it was just, it was a very consistent message that was being said. So they never, they never wavered. And in some ways, like that's, more admirable i guess because they that's, that's their conviction yeah that they, they they're doing it for my sake so that later on i wouldn't struggle with it it would just be the the norm yeah and i guess how were they i i know we're going to get into a little more details but how are they um accepting who you are now um yeah i'm really shocked by how well they've been able to adapt their or I guess being able to separate their Mm -hmm. belief or their perception of right and wrong from like yeah their relationship to me I think Mm -hmm. that they're no longer seeing it as my actions reflect on them or that they're going to be held responsible for the decisions that I make or you know how religious I am I think that I I don't know how but they've reached um an ability to compartmentalize all of that and just sort of look at what we have in common um, yeah and what relation what part of the relationships they want to preserve and sort of not ignore but um I guess tolerate the things that that um that are different or that we can conflict on And just out of curiosity, did you study in an Islamic school? No. So I actually, um, so grew up in Australia and then within Australia, a very westernised area, like a particularly Australian area of Australia. Um, So there wasn't even a local Islamic school that wasn't an option um, and the community was pretty much non-existent. So um, all of my education was done at home um or we'd access online resources and sort of study this stuff as a family um so that was very interesting because I guess that sort of forced my parents to really um control mine and my brother's environments a lot more and we were Mm -hmm. extremely insular so like right we did everything as a family 
our, all my socialization was with my family because I also, like you, had the warnings that, um, you know, Muslims and non-Muslims aren't made to be friends. They're sort of yeah. the natural enemies of one another and, um, yeah, like a, a Muslim just can't trust. So um, how did you make friends growing up? Was it just your family that were, and, and by family, um, is it, your cousins as well or just your immediate family um that are that were insular yeah uh, um yeah i think it was yeah so we don't have that we didn't have that much family around so it was just me and my immediate family and then mm -hmm. one uncle and my cousins um so yeah it was a very very small group but even them because they were quite westernized um my family w were a bit hesitant my parents were a bit hesitant to i guess let me be influenced by yeah. the sorts of things that they were compromising on um so yeah like we still were able to spend time together but they were very keen i guess to keep us sort of in and check and keep us in check yeah really being able to monitor what sort of content we were um what sort of content we were exposed to and ensuring that i guess the way that we were spending our time mm -hmm. was in ways that would increase our faith and not present any opportunity for um like deviance because yeah. obviously there's there's a belief that even when like if you're alone or you're spending time, you know, chatting about something inconsequential, or you're you're engaging mm -hmm. in laughter too much. That the really, is, yeah, laughter is actually wow. not discouraged, but they Islamically like there's a authentic hadith that says to moderate your laughter because I thought um, it was laughing loud as a lady. Yeah, so that's the the issue with the aura for women. Yeah. Because you can attract a man with your mm -hmm. um, melodious laugh or something like that. Yeah. But there was also the fact that laughter can, I guess, I don't, I don't remember. It's something about like it um, calls the shaitan or something. Yeah, yeah but it sort of corrupts the heart in some way. It opens yeah. up to the shaitan preying on them. So they always wanted to make sure that there was no opportunity mm -hmm. for the shaitan to just, you know sit there and plant those yeah I guess there. I guess in in my we 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 were never we were never that strict I know laughter came up once or twice but it was never that modulated but I felt like when I was at home because I was somebody who would actively listen to like lectures in the mosque or um, research a lot so if I was being religious, um, it never like if I wanted to stop listening to music it never came from my parents it went like it was mostly me. I mean, the rule was that on religious days or evenings or um, like the prophet's uh, birthday or death day, we don't listen to any music or Muharram. Right. But I guess with my family, they were would watch movies if my dad was in there. Um, and then we would quickly before when the when the when the channel came on, we would turn it to the news channel and then turn it off. So that when he turned on the TV, he would see the news oh, channel. Nice. That's that's how like we were so smart about it. I think my mom was quite like, yeah, look, you shouldn't watch, but then she enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, and she would some, yeah. It was. I I think moms sometimes can be um, quite lenient on things like this. But then when it came to hijab, she was the one who held it more. Um, I guess more stricter in my view. Mm. Yeah. Uh, um. Sorry. So I was just gonna ask. Um. So it looks like you were like quite. You were in a very strict household, especially if it was laughing. And did you have any other siblings who feel like you or had felt like you? Um. It was never like. And there was never like open rebellion. Sorry, I think that's me in my eye. Um, so I'm just going to keep talking, just ignore no, <laughs> the, it's fine. Um, the 
the eye that's now weeping. <laughs> um, I know yeah, I had I had one of them, and this girl was talking about how happy she was, and a tear just came out, and I'm like, I'm not crying. <laughs> There's something in my eye. <laughs> Except there legitimately is something in my eye. <laughs> No, that the, there was a, then as well, but it just the timing was. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it yeah. like it was, it was impeccable. It was like, oh okay, it's just gonna fall yeah. down. Uncanny. <laughs> um. So oh yeah, so I think um my brother was the first one to have trouble with the suffocating nature of um, mm -hmm. I guess our lifestyle, and because mm -hmm. there was just really. A ridiculous level of of deprivation and I think when you follow a Salafi um, interpretation the difficult thing about it is and I, I don't know if people really appreciate it it's they don't just look at um, minimizing the opportunities to sin it's also minimizing opportunities to come in top contact with things that may lead to that sin and that can yeah. be such a wide that just opens everything up then to mm -hmm. scrutiny and um, everything becomes a risk factor essentially. So can you give um, us an example? Um, I guess like the, the classic thing is that, well, I mean, yeah. So like they wouldn't let us sp spend time, uh, like too much time alone because then potentially you might start thinking about things that wow. other than Islam and you wouldn't be reminded, like you wouldn't be in the presence of people that would remind you of Islam. And then once you start thinking about it, then the shaitan could pounce on that and then create further um, or like just cause the snowball effect and cause you to yeah. doubt even more. So it was always just about guarding yourself from the thing that, is standard like is more standard to avoid so it's like it's like this is a circle of things that sorry here we go the circle of things that are sinning and then it just widens that circle yeah. to everything around it that could interact um so i'm trying to think of um another another example but oh, okay so like i don't know but listening to music we weren't we, like we weren't allowed to listen to music at all um unless it was the tabla so like the drums and um no music is just that yeah. but there was like my little brother found a technicality once that was like um like um the electronic music because it's technically not an it's actual strange. instrument yeah. yeah like it's it's um computer generated mm -hmm. but then you know, my dad was like, well, it's going to make you want to listen to all the other music. So, yeah, it, you know what I mean? It could it could lead to that temptation. Yeah. And I think like that's the whole um, justification behind things like, you know, not like gender segregation. Yeah. It, you not only is having a, a relationship forbidden, so sorry, not only is having sex outside of marriage forbidden, but then having a relationship is forbidden. And yeah. then to, to like a man and a woman being alone together is forbidden. It's like how many steps before the big sin? Yeah, you know, exactly. Like, you weren't even allowed to be friends with males. Exactly. If it's if it's not work or you need like like work or like study related, you can't even go like, oh hey, how was your weekend? Yeah, yeah. And even then, like I think I never had and I never really like had a project with um a male yeah. or anything like that. So it never came up. But I don't think my dad would have even let me like yeah. work like study related stuff with a guy. Um yeah. so yeah, so exactly. So some of the some of those big um things like some of that mentality is a little bit more mainstream, but I yeah. guess that deprivation circle was apply to almost every aspect of of our life and so yeah so my brother got pretty sick of it and I think um he got a lot of pressure um as the the eldest male I think from my dad because he saw him as like I don't know in some ways it's it's really interesting like it took me a really long time to recognize the misogyny in Islam because my brother got such harsh treatment 
as yeah. well. And it's because he was in the future, like my dad was training him to be responsible for, for the whole family. For the whole family, exactly. So it still was misogynistic, which I didn't understand at the time. But yeah, um, yeah like he like the way he dressed was really moderated. My dad was really um, strict on us not looking too Western as well. Like Egyptians don't really have a specific Mm -hmm. dress code, but he was like, you know, don't style your hair this way. Don't wear shorts, you know, above the knee. Don't wear singlets. Like, um, you know, like I don't want you to look like, that's also like forbidden in the doctrine but Mm -hmm. it was mainly because he just didn't want him to feel as though he was emulating those yeah he wanted him to emulate the prophet and the companion yeah um so yeah i guess that's when in answer to the question about like the siblings i think that was the right one that struggled as well yeah and i and i guess because you were so closed off to thinking outside um, what has been put forward to you and um, just staying away from a lot of things that can potentially um, cause you to sin. How did you actually come to, you said you had doubts as a teenager. How did you actually come to address those doubts? I guess this kind of mm-hmm. delves into like, I know leaving Islam is not a one day thing that so happens over years, but just to understand how you, how those rules actually caused you to then leave and be brave about it. Hmm. Um, I think like, so as I got older, like particularly, um, after leaving high school, um, because I was so committed to the religion and that was sort of my most religious phase. Um, I also had a, like a bit more independence. So my family wasn't scrutinizing sort of who I was spending time with as much. And I, I got a job at that point. So then I had a whole new um I guess uh, a whole new group of people to interact with a whole new range of experiences to have um and I think uh I was able to spend like time with like I, I did make friends throughout high school so even though I was encouraged not to um make like keep the company of non-Muslims that didn't pan out in real life yeah. so that was the sort of propaganda I was fed but it definitely wasn't something that I did you have to hide that even if they're women um no so they they knew that I was like I had good friends um that were non-muslim but they just didn't like let me spend that much time with them that's mm-hmm. prior to the sort of new independence I got after leaving school um and I think they thought like I was getting yeah, enough religion on my own that I they trusted me to make the right decisions. So, yeah. um, you know, I started, I guess, spending time with who I wanted and, um, yeah, being exposed to a whole new range of, of people. And, and with them just comes new ideas and just normalising, um, you know, a world outside of your own bubble. So yeah. I think bit by bit, I was just the stigmas, I think, that were attached to um, just the, like, Western way of life or the propaganda that I'd been fed. It just didn't didn't stack up and it wasn't something that I was consciously thinking of. I think these ideas were just sort of unwinding on their own and um, the, the clincher... I think that the big thing that sort of made the rest of the foundation um, sort of unsteady was reevaluating the hijab. So, um, you know, I'd been fem- a feminist for a while. I'd considered myself feminist for a while. And there were a lot of things that I found that were conflicting in the um, Islamic doctrine. And, you know, obviously I, I had come across the hadith that women were deficient in intelligence and that, Um, one of the reasons they were deficient in religion was because they menstruated and therefore they couldn't pray and fast and worship for a certain portion of the month. And, like, I just remember being really outraged that that was used as a justification for why there were going to be more women in hell, even though 
that was a predicament that was purposefully created by God himself. And yeah. it was just like, what the hell? So all of these things were sort of stacking up on their own. And I was really, um, yeah, I had like a sort of a barely suppressed rage for mm-hmm. a few years regarding women's rights. And um, I was learning a lot about marriage and divorce, like learning a lot about fiqh. So that's the like, understanding Islamic law, the philosophy of Islamic law. Mm-hmm and um wasn't sounding good to me like the more I was yeah the more questions I had and um I think so with that newfound independence as those things were stacking up I was starting to think about them a little bit more critically Mm -hmm. and I began to have a language to like I guess articulate this inequality that I was seeing because no one in my previous bubble had ever been able to or had even dared to, um, yeah, look at this stuff objectively. So this was the first time, even though um, sort of these feminists generally weren't talking about um, Islamic inequality, I was able to look at what they were saying and apply it to the doctrine. Mm -hmm. And um, So, yeah, it was sort of slowly getting shakier and shakier and then when I got to the point of hijab and I started to understand how hijab fit into the whole idea of rape culture and victim blaming and you know how um, sort of purity culture and honor culture and all of those things intersect to further um, just to really exacerbate the existing problems and the lie that you know we've all been told yeah that it protects us from sexual assault and and violence it yeah. just doesn't play out in reality yeah. and so when I realized that there was absolutely no way that a divine being could have you know uh thought of the concept of hijab and then um you know put it like sanctioned it in Islamic law so that women who feared hell and punishment were so scared that they obeyed and did it and that men then had justification to impose it and you know validate sort of this you know this existing like structural inequality I just thought like this is just such a mess yeah it, it it's worsened the problem more than anything else could have and there's just yeah. no that um this has come from a divine being. So I think that then opened the can of worms. It opened the yeah. door box and I was then able, all of those doubts that I'd suppressed, um, you know, over 10, 11 years yeah. were suddenly like, okay, did you, you found this questionable before? Maybe that's okay. Maybe you were right to question yeah. this. Let's actually examine this objectively. And, um, yeah. So my experience was the complete opposite, where I had never read any of the hadiths or any anything that strikingly was misogynistic. Um, you know, all the hadiths about saying women were deficient in faith was after I left. Um, wow. And yeah, and it was after I left where I was like, because I had to validate myself. I, I felt like I have to need, I, I needed a strong reason to not be a Muslim. So I'm like, okay, so what does that mean? Like, why is everybody, why are all the ex-Muslims so, not, not aggressive, but they were like, why are they so against Islam? Like, I just left because I did not like how violent some people were and they were quoting the books and there's something fundamentally wrong with the book that, you know, it hates homosexuals. It doesn't like women as much because we have to wear a hijab and men don't. But then there were so many little things that I had never been taught. And right now, if you ask my family about the punishment of apostasy, they have no idea. They still don't know it. Even like it's been three years since I've left. They still don't know it because, um, you know, they like we were just, I guess we were just taught um, a very fluffy and peaceful version of it. So when I have a discussion with my family and they're like, you know, but you can't say things about the prophet. And I'm like, how much of his history do you know? And they're like, 
it's still not nice when you talk about yeah. it, even if you don't agree with it. And I'm like, okay. And it's it's not that they're justifying Aisha's age or anything, but they truly believe that, you know, Aisha was an adult and that Muhammad, you know, freed slaves and that was nice. Um, so I guess in their defense, this is like not even a cognitive dissonance. Yeah. I mean, there, there are a few things where, you know, like, is that really my fault if somebody looks at me because my shoulders are showing like, mm -hmm. or like my neck is showing and then they have to go and like, hmm, no, but you're provoking them. And I was like, how? And I gave them an example about rape, like not just harassment, but I'm like, rape. So they kind of get it, but a lot of times they just don't want to talk about it. And I think that's our happy medium. But it's so interesting to see that there were so many reasons for you to build up and leave. And for me, it was mostly like, it, there weren't a lot of reasons until after I left. Yeah. Yeah, until after I'd accepted. And I'm like, like, I already knew God didn't exist. And I say that because for the longest time, I hadn't prayed and I didn't feel guilty about praying at all. I, I felt I felt a little bad that this is what I should be doing, but I didn't yeah. feel very guilty about it because you know when I left it was just okay, cool. I um, I haven't been praying for ten years, so might as well just leave. Yeah. And and it was just like I already knew that, like I said, I was never given that purpose in Islam, so mm -hmm. I already had built up my purpose, which was to be more career oriented, more women oriented. So when I left, it just, like, for me, it was like, okay, well, nothing really changed except for my relationship with my family and, you know, explaining to others why I talk about Islam or, like, mm -hmm. why I'm really unhappy with it and why ex-Muslims should be heard. Um, and it was when I started Faithless Hijabi that I realized that there are so many women who had very different upbringing or had very, li even liberal upbringing, and not strict or have never worn hijab, but were, you know, were constantly told about it. Mm -hmm. And the, like we've all met, we've all met each other somewhere. Like we all have this really, really big overlapping story. Um, so it's really interesting to see that it took a lot for you to like break out of it. And yeah. I guess in terms of like, when you did realize that there's something wrong with this, you know, given, so many things and you said you were a feminist um was that was that in contradiction to like when you read more about islam did you believe that you could be a feminist as a muslim um i think a lot earlier on so when i was a little bit less informed i definitely believed it so at the point where i just sort of believed all the propaganda like the very uh, surface level mm -hmm. things about women's rights in Islam so basically the, the typical arguments of um you know Muhammad gave women rights before um the west you know women mm -hmm. were property and um they weren't able to I think that they couldn't have their own money or maybe it was they, they couldn't own property Something they couldn't own property yeah mm. And, you know, Islam's like the first religion that gave them that right. And yeah. so just based on those things yeah. um, or that, you know, women in Islam have, um, oh, I don't know, I don't, I don't remember any of it anymore, but, you know, there was a very sort of set list of one, two, three, four. These are all the things that Islam gave women. Or probably yeah. they used the fact that um, uh, baby girls were oh, buried. buried before yeah. Islam came and it it cleared up that ignorance and valued um you know women in a way that they hadn't been before and mm -hmm. um maybe the fact that they could um that yeah that mothers are honored um you know above above all else mm -hmm. so the little things like that so I think that's when I believed that um a Muslim could could be a feminist but I was sort of, as I was getting older, so like probably 15 and up, I was building my understanding of feminism at the same time that I was building my understanding of Islam. So I think that they were sort of two worlds 
but I guess mm -hmm. I, I didn't really have to reconcile until I was a little bit further along. Um, mm -hmm. and that was when there was some, like cl some clashes became apparent and, um, yeah, I felt really stuck at those points. So, um, you know, I really felt like things like I knew about, you know, marital rape being a really yeah. big issue. And at that point I was really getting into, um, like domestic violence advocacy and, um, yeah, like rape advocacy and all that sort of stuff. And like just the literature around all of that. And like, I just, and I, I was seeing just the structural, or like, like how patriarchy was just, yeah, dictated everything in the sun, like the guardianship system and all of that. And yeah. It was just really difficult to process. Yeah. Um, so I think that took me a few years to just really understand what, what feminism was and what it meant to me and yeah. then reconcile it with what um, Islam was demanding of mm -hmm. me to believe and then it sort of all fell apart once I faced that reality. Yeah, and I mean, before we, <clears throat> I know, <clears throat> sorry, um, before we get into, like, I, I am, I really want to know about your views and feminism, because I know that's something you're passionate about, but, and also the event with Roxanne Gay and Christina Hofsimmers. So that's something I want to get into it. But I guess <clears throat> in terms of like knowing that, you know, the feminism that you thought Islam um, was an advocate of and then coming out on the other side what are your thoughts on like Muslim women who are feminists right now and I've always had I've always been like half half on this where I'm like if you're advocating for the hijab then you know I don't think you really know that it's um, I guess tying women down I just don't mm. like imprisoning women yeah imprisoning women mm. even though some people say they choose to wear it mm. um and I guess I just wanted to know what were your thoughts on like you know the Muslim feminists who advocate for hijab but also other things that can symbolize with something that ex-Muslims are doing right now and you know apart from the hijab bit but like helping Muslim women regardless of their beliefs, um, come outside of the, like, not come outside of the religion, but come outside of that misogyny and abused, um, abused by, because of honour? Hmm. I think, um, yeah, it's sort of hard to, like, it is a complex issue, like, thinking of what sort of thought processes go into um, that sort of, that mm -hmm. worldview. But I think there's a, yeah, there's a lot of layers to it. So when I was in that position and I was advocating for hijab and I was advocating um, for Islam's, I guess, um, Islam's women's rights, <laughs> um, which don't exist. But <laughs> when, when I was, um, you know, at that point, I think like there was very severe like cognitive dissonance going on. But it was there because like it was there as a survival mechanism. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I was in an environment, I was in a situation where I really needed to believe that, um, you know, I could make these two worlds meet. Um, mm -hmm. I, I didn't have a choice around Islam at the time. And I, I didn't, I never thought at the time that I would be in mm -hmm. a position that I am now where I was free to, to completely choose my own beliefs. And, you know, I was just trying to find a way to, to, to make my real values, which, you know, would be feminism, yeah. seem acceptable given my, my Muslim identity. And I think there's also that, that's that also competing with, there's like a, an instinct among all Muslims to protect the, the, the image of Islam at all costs and we're all especially hijabis are actually um like you have sort of this unique role of being almost like propaganda machines because you are representing the faith and um you, you almost become icons for yeah. islam and um 
people like Muslims know that women are going to be asked about all of these issues. So I think a lot of parents raise their daughters yeah. with a specific narrative, knowing that that's what's going to get put out into the world. And um, there's a real sense of duty, I think, to portray um, a message about Islam that's going to be favourable to the, the West while also yeah. staying within the boundaries, like safe boundaries. That's not going to push you into the um, the territory of dissent. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a lot of sort of competing priorities that Muslim women are trying to navigate through mm-hmm. without having to sacrifice one world yeah. or the other. And I feel like this is a bigger problem or a bigger issue, especially in the West, than it is in the Middle East itself. And I feel like most of the feminists or most of the people who have been vocal about it or protective about the hijab have been from the West. And yeah. I think it, it comes from, um, I don't know if you've watched the TV show Caliphate, but they're basically about these two sisters who um, are born into an apostate family. So their parents are not practicing, but then they end up joining ISIS because there was a conflict between their identity in the West and that they had demonized the West. And this wasn't coming from their parents at all. So this was like the parent, like the father, when he saw his daughter wearing a hijab, he's like, take it off now. It's like, Mm -hmm. this is not who we are. And I feel Mm -hmm. like that's how they wanted to have a sense of belonging where they were like, Mm -hmm. we're going to fight all of you. Um, and I think like that's I think that is more prevalent in the West than it is in what major, Muslim majority countries. Like I had never grown up seeing Muslim women not wear the hijab, but in Pakistan there were a lot of women who do, who don't wear hijab, mm-hmm. and they will still be defensive about it, or they'll just like, yeah, look, I'm not a perfect Muslim, but they had the yeah, option like, to do it, and they're not they exactly yeah either. Yeah, and it's it's always really surprising to me that um, it's always women in the West who are advocating for it because they feel that sense to protect it. But then at the same time, I can understand why that sense comes in. They're in the West where people have also demonized it quite a bit. Um, yeah. Like, I remember I think- when... Sorry, go on. No, no, you I was going to say, I remember like previously when I used to see apps like Airbnb um, have hijab icons on it, it, I used to go like, but why? Mm -hmm. Or or like, or like emojis and whatnot. And then I realized that I think it's important for us to acknowledge that they exist and not to erase them. I think it's important for us to acknowledge that representation is very much needed because there's so many little girls who were like little Zaras at one point and had thought that they could never be able to speak in public because that was not something that women would do. Mm-hmm. And that when I see swimsuit models wearing a burkini and I'm like, I don't know how to feel about that because like, I, I know at the same time, if I hate on that person, their Islam is hating on her too, for mm-hmm. the very same reason, apparently, because she's not wearing it properly. And then there is the, the far right also waiting her, uh, hating on her, saying, well, it's because she's, where, she's there at all, representing some form of it. So that's why my views, while, I've, while I really dislike hijab, has been like, I think representation should exist. Um, and I think it's important for other people to see it. Um, and also like, we have to understand that even if they're adult women, they're also a result of indoctrination, which at some point I was, and that I may or may not be able to walk them out of it or hope any different for them. Like, I do hope different for them, but I may not be able to follow up with that hope for it because ultimately expect adults to do their own thing. I was wondering what your views were and if that has changed now or recently. I think that's like a really interesting um, perspective. So you've got the more obvious um, perspective, which is let's not normalize something which is um, at its core misogynistic and oppressive and contradicts a lot of Western values. Mm -hmm. Um, So like, let's not normalize that as a, 
I guess, as an, an acceptable way for women to live. And then on the other hand, like, I, I think there's a lot of validity to what you're saying, which is <laughs> when we represent these women, we're actually giving them agency and mm -hmm. we're saying, okay, you're like, you're adult women, you exist in this society as well. And I think in some ways by bringing them into the fold, um, we're empowering them to, to potentially consider whether this is what they want and mm -hmm. how they're going to fit into a free society. Whereas if we exclude them to, or like push them to the fringes of society, not only does that, I think that has two effects. It reinforces a victimhood narrative that is mm -hmm. very, very strong within Muslim communities. And it's um, toxic as well. Yeah. I, I think a lot of um, like preachers and, 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 their families and their communities really capitalize on any sort of anti-Muslim or anti-Islamic um, rhetoric and say, see, look, this is what we've always been told. This is what our doctrine has told us that, um, you know, non-Muslims will never accept us. They'll never, yeah. um, will never believe as equals. And this yeah. is why we need to stand our ground. This is why mm -hmm. we need to live Islam unapologetically. And I yeah. think that's why, you know, as you were saying earlier, that, this um really strong defense of hijab exists in the west it's because it is a political um, yeah. it is a political defense mechanism yeah. as a way of reasserting an identity um particularly within um you know when when the victimhood narrative is so strong um so there's they're resisting um exclusion and so that that feels like a very valid fight to take on um, so I think, yeah, so, so in not representing Muslim women and saying, no, this isn't acceptable, like hijab isn't an acceptable way to exist. We push them to the fringes where mm -hmm. they potentially become more conservative or they're, um, yeah, more valid. They, they feel more valid in, um, that, that narrative and they are, yeah, like that, that way of thinking is just going to continue to be reinforced and they're never going to be exposed to the full extent of their yeah. um their opportunities and yeah. in each of those opportunities is an opportunity for these women to um yeah see their worth and potentially reconsider what yeah what they've been taught and like I don't want to just look at it from the perspective of trying to get you know women out of hijab but yeah like ultimately that is something that I see as being a positive because yeah. I believe that it's, um, yeah, it's very restrictive. Yeah. Oppressive. So, and like, I think, you know, there's a lot of, a big sort of debate that continues to circle around again and again about, you know, some women chose the hijab, therefore can hijab represent choice. And I think there's a very easy way to like distinguish that, the hijab itself is a, a garment that represents false modesty. Um, yeah. It is a religious garment and within the religion, it, like, there is no choice around it. It is following yeah. with threats of punishment. It's brainwashing. It's indoctrination. It, it's introduced at a young age where consent doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, it is linked with your social status and um, your opportunities for marriage and, and so many other things mm -hmm. within the community. So I think we can say that that's what hijab is and that like hijab itself doesn't represent choice, but that some women choose to wear it. Yeah. So like, I, I don't think these, these um, narratives have to, um, they're not like mutually exclusive. Like we can understand that the hijab itself is a really problematic garment but also that some women choose to embrace it for whatever yeah. um, reasons appeal to them, but that doesn't yeah. change what it actually means. Yeah, and I, I really want to, like, as, you know, we're going to go into your um, event with um, Oksane Gay Intersectional Feminism just a bit now, but then I want to expand more on it in our feminism series with Suzanne. Mm -hmm. So, um, actually... I was thinking maybe we could leave that for the series with Suzanne, but then getting back to 
your journey again. So um, I love talking about feminism with you. I think we have found ways where we've got like, oh, we disagree and then find out that actually we agree on our base of like what we want for women in the world and how we practice it or how we action it can be a little different. Um, so by the way, guys, I've known Umayma for about two years now. Mm -hmm. And we've spent a lot of time in this and her story every like I, I wouldn't say every time I hear it, but I feel like every time we all talk about our story, we uncover a lot of different things. Yeah. And that a lot of a lot of like, you know, like 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 I said, that my journey was very different. So I, mm -hmm. I had no idea like that's I guess that's how you lived. But you you did speak about your doubts with um feminism and I guess understanding that a lot of it was a lot of Islam. A religion was restrictive how did you then um express it or leave um how mm. what what were the practical things that you did with yeah. so i think um yeah the, the, that first element was realizing that like i think because I'd, I'd never wanted to wear hijab to begin with i mm -hmm. i didn't like it i'd gone through this whole um process of suppressing my true feelings about it and trying to own it and actually become an advocate of it and um so much like I, I really re I guess there's, there's something I really resent is how much I had to fight myself on something that should have been my choice to begin with um but yeah I guess when I realized that I didn't believe that hijab was um the, the product of of divine commandments, um, then I sort of Im immediately wanted to take it off. Like it was like that, um, you know, all of those feelings from before I'd sort of been forced to put it on came rushing back. All of that, um, that conviction that I'd had that was sort of my natural self um, came rushing back and I just thought, oh, my God. Like I, I can't stand this this garment anymore. Like I've I've done everything that I possibly can to make this work and to represent what a Muslim woman should be, and like I'm just not having it any any longer. Particularly because I didn't feel like there was, um, yeah, like there there was nothing divine about it. So I wanted to. You all right? Sorry. Yeah, I think I just dropped the mouse in. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's okay. Um, so I, um, yeah, I basically wanted to take it off straight away. And I think that urgency really pushed me to go through that journey of, like, really considering what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go, what my options are a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I knew straight away, like, sort of without even having to think about it, that I wasn't going to be able to, um, remove the hijab in my current situation like it had never been an option to begin with and it wasn't going to be an option now particularly since there's such a stigma around removing the hijab so mm -hmm. it's one thing for a woman to not put it on to begin with like that's enough of a disappointment but for a woman to put it on I don't know why but this idea of a woman then choosing to take it off is seen as like a graver sin than mm -hmm. Never having to. Oh, never have it. Place. Yeah. Um, so it's also. I think it's also the rejection of ever having put it first. It's the rejection of like I've put it and I'm saying no. So yeah. you have you felt you felt what it is like wearing it, and you've been holy, and now you're going back to. Yeah. So you're going. You're going the other way and saying now nah, did it done it, but have if you've never done this, a lot of people can then go like, but have you tried? Yeah, and yeah, see yeah, how be and I think they they can then fetishize or glorify the hijab to yeah. other women, and becomes like this sort of this fantasy of yeah, you know, you don't know any better. And yeah, I think that's a really really good point actually. Um, yeah, so I, I knew that wasn't an option, and I just thought, okay, so like, what am I going to do about this? And I just had to think, like, I guess evaluate what the stakes were and that made me consider like where I was with the religion as a whole and 
you know, after a few weeks, I sort of realized that I was willing to, to put all of that behind me. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I acknowledged the fact that I felt that my relationship with God had always been extremely toxic. Um, it was a, I think, like a, a connection that I would consider as, as being abusive. Like mm-hmm. I really, especially with that Salafi mindset, I'd always felt like I, the mm-hmm. the notion of, um, you know, our us being created and then tested, mm-hmm. and then having to follow a rigorous set yeah. of rules that were also vague and extremely contradictory, and we had no way of knowing whether we were ever doing enough to get yeah. into heaven, and um, we had it really sort of drilled into us that it's not enough to to believe Muslims can also go into hell and yeah. um, the only guarantee is that you'll eventually end up in heaven so um you know I'd lived a lot of my life feeling quite defeated about yeah. what my chances were of going into heaven despite the fact that yeah. I was trying my best so um you know I felt like the whole premise of our existence was mm-hmm. that God was putting a gun to our heads and saying, yeah. do this or else, you know, you, you, this is this is the punishment. And then he was demanding that we fear him and love him and be grateful to him and yeah. rely on him. And, yeah, it was just like I just had the most awful perception of God and yeah. I was finally able to, to acknowledge that and go, okay, I'm, I'm ready to let go of that from mm-hmm. my life. And so now I can actually take action. And I, I needed to go through all of that so that I wouldn't feel like there was, like I was looking over my shoulder, right? I needed I needed to establish how far mm-hmm. I was willing to go at this point from, from a spiritual perspective. Yeah. Um, so once I sort of reached the point that I was saying, okay, I don't think I want to be Muslim anymore, mm-hmm. um, I ended up, because I, I couldn't speak to anyone that's Muslim. Yeah. It's so goddamn taboo. Yeah. So I reached out to some high school friends. Uh-huh. Um, so as I said, I'd been able to make some really close friends. Yeah. Um, because they, they were not Muslim. And um, I sort of said to them, oh, so this is what I'm thinking. And, I mean, they were shocked and, like, but they just had no concept of, what that meant for me and Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as I explained to them guys that this is going to mean that I have to move out this means that I potentially Mm -hmm. can't speak to my family ever again this means this and just sort of describing what the reality is it was they were quickly quite overwhelmed by the situation as well and they were just like oh I don't don't know what you should do I don't know what advice um, yeah give you and and it's it it makes sense like no one yeah it's it's such a, a bizarre reality that exactly all that we have that that you even have to come out and you know we're still calling it as coming out yeah um and that That's we accurate. just and it's a belief in our head so it's um it's it is quite it is quite rare to have other people who've never been in a religious cult to have to come out about their beliefs that they think is in their head in a relationship with um god or a higher power so a lot yeah. of times they were like you have to be verbal about it like yeah like my parents took me to church and once i just said no and that was fine yeah <laughs> it's just and I, I think it was the fact that um as i said like i'd really tried to own islam in high school and stuff so they'd never seen this side of me the side that was really doubting and i, I don't think they realized how heavily I'd been coerced into mm-hmm. all of that. And um, so when, with me sort of laying out this reality of, hang on, the reason that I was who I was um, is, you know, because of my family, because of this mm-hmm. religion that, where I was so afraid of hell and I was so afraid of punishment that I was willing to sacrifice myself um, mm-hmm in order to yeah I guess just uh, escape that risk of of punishment and um 
yeah, like and explain to them, hey, I've actually been fighting myself for years, but now I'm willing to fight for myself. And yeah, it was just really overwhelming for them. And they were just, um, yeah, stunned by the whole situation. And Mm -hmm. um, there was one particular friend that I think she was the only one that had moved out of home at this point. Mm -hmm. So she was living in her own house. And she said to me, um, look, why don't you like, oh, this is all really big. And I'm it's really good that you're thinking about all of this. You might just need to, um, you know, come and stay with me for a few days and think about it in your own space and mm-hmm. just sort of make a plan from there. And I said to her, like, I'm like, that it's not my reality that I have the freedom to just come mm-hmm. and stay with you. I was just going to say, how did that work out? Yeah, it didn't. Yeah. Um, I just said to her, like, I've never had a sleepover. Like, I've never been yeah. able to sleep at, a, at, at another um, person's house unless yeah. there was a male, uh, a mohram there. So, you know, someone that could act as a male guardian. So the only sleepover I've yeah. had was with my, um, at my uncle's house. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, that was only when I was younger. So um, after that, because they had, I had the male cousin and even that wasn't allowed yeah um, is non mahram so I just said to her I can't even do that like whatever I do it it has to be extreme and I knew at that point that I had to move out yeah but then I also knew that I wasn't going to be allowed to move out so it was going to have to be essentially just running away from home yeah um, but I didn't have any concept of how to do that you know I had some independence by that point um, I'd really fought to have a job and mm-hmm. I had some savings behind me so that was really lucky but I just was like oh I don't I don't know how to move out like I yeah. don't know what to do um and that same friend that had offered me to stay temporarily said all right just move here mm-hmm. um obviously don't tell anyone where you've come get your money together get your belongings together and as soon as you can just come and move yeah. and you can live here temporarily until we can work out yeah the next step together so um that was like really generous of her and basically I just realized at that point it was now or never like yeah. there was no in-between option that was yeah. going to work my, my family was you know they were completely living in their bubble they, they there was nothing that was going to shake them out of it except for yeah. me to demand my rights in the most sort of decisive way possible and um yeah so I think yeah within the next few days I well actually what was interesting is the conversation that I had with my friend on the phone Mm -hmm. um my mum was actually listening at the door and she Mm -hmm. heard that I was planning to leave okay and she she confronted me about it and she said what's all of it so you're just planning to leave like what the hell and I don't think she knew it was because I didn't believe anymore. I think she just heard the parts about me saying I wanted to come stay. Um, and, you know, I just sort of, oh, yeah, I was deer in headlights. I was just like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about, blah, blah, blah. And then she said, look, I'm not going to stop you. Um, yeah. I'm not going to tell your dad. I think, you know, this is just something that you're, like, you've got to do and, I still to this day don't really understand. Did she think Um, it was a phase or that you'd come back? Yeah, I think maybe she just thought it was a temporary, like Mm -hmm. I was just staying there for a few days. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure, but like she was really angry um, when we had the conversation and she was just sort of like trying to, I think she was just trying to like knock some sense into me and go like, do you know what you're doing? Like, Yeah. Yeah, do you know what you're doing? And um yeah I just sort of said I just didn't really answer and she just said look I'm not going to tell your dad like you do what what you're going to do because that's interesting it's very interesting um but I think she just sort of knew if I was at that point there was nothing that they could do Mm -hmm. um and I don't know maybe she felt like it was her one chance to do right by you yeah maybe I it's very very conflicting yeah Um, 
I mean, another pessimistic view could be, um, you know, that she possibly wanted you to come crawling back. Maybe because uh, I feel like sometimes our parents have handicapped us mm. a lot of times. Um, a lot of like when I talked to when I talked to Zahra from Canada, and she mm. was like, "I had never taken a bus alone." Yeah. So there's a lot of like, we're going to shelter you and we're going to protect you, and that you owe us your life. Yeah. Um, that 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 is that has been like you know my parents sometimes like my mom says but I had you in my belly for nine months. And I'm like, well, should have aborted me, but this is still my life. Like you can't hold that against me. I, and she doesn't know what to reply because she's like, should I say I should have? <laughs> like, she's just quiet then. And I'm like, that's yeah. right. Um, yeah, and like, I, I do get it. Like, you know, for the longest time, I had that guilt that I owe my parents my life. That you know, every time, every every like, I didn't want to post up a photo of without my headscarf, and I was like, my parents are not going to be happy with it. And he went like, Do you want? It? Like a friend of mine actually sat down, and this was in Sydney. He's like, Do you want? It? And I'm like, Yeah, but you know, I owe them my life, and, and they've done so much for me. They paid for my tuition and everything. And he's like. Zara, if you have a kid, are you having a kid so that your kid can owe you their life? Or at yeah. that point in time, you're having a kid because you want one. You want to, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and then when you have a kid, it is your responsibility to take care of them, not mm. not like you're doing them a favor, Yeah. right? The way you want to live your life, your kid will want to live their life as well. So think mm -hmm. of it from that perspective, and that really helped. And that was really hard to help our parents understand um, that, you know, like, this is my life. I need to live this way. And I still have my parents calling me now, and they're like, um, I'm not going to ask you to come back to Islam, but can you not, like, talk about the Prophet that way or Mamali that way? And then I'm like, I understand it hurts you, but... I write these things because there's so many people that relate to me. There's so many people's freedom of expression that has been cut out from their lives who can relate to me. And the idea is to support the notion that you can talk about it without getting killed. And they didn't completely disagree with me. They're like, yeah, it hurts us, but you know, they shouldn't be killed. So yeah. I guess they're still learning to find a happy medium. So I guess, how has that changed with you? Like when you left, what was that like? And then what has been happening since? Yeah. Um, so I think in the, in the immediate, um, so I, I ended up writing a letter mm -hmm. to my parents and saying, um, you know, basically I just need some space to um, evaluate what my beliefs are and to, work out what I want out of my life and mm -hmm. um just sort of like vaguely just saying mm -hmm. I need space yeah um, and so obviously my mom already knew that I was leaving but when my dad came home then she called and she said oh you you know your dad's just found out he's really devastated um you know he doesn't he doesn't understand what's sort of happening um, yeah and I said to her um you know, like, you know, like what I said in the letter is exactly how I feel. I just need the freedom yeah. to be my own person and um, I guess make the choices that were denied to me um, sort of as a, as a person that was born into a son. Like I, I never chose mm -hmm. anything about myself and now I need to. Um, and you know, there, yeah, there was a, a few sort of, bar there was a little bit of bargaining, like, oh, you can take your hijab off if you come back and we'll let you work late. Um, mm -hmm. you know, basically just a lot of the, the problems that I'd raised to them um, over yeah. the years about how I felt restricted and they were saying, oh, mm -hmm. like, we'll loosen those restrictions. And I said, look, it's actually a lot bigger than that. Um, I don't, I don't, like I said, I'm, really doubting that God even exists and um like I don't know if I'm yeah I, I don't think I'm going to be following a religion mm -hmm. sort of going forward and like just trying to sort of mm -hmm. br 
bring the idea to her mind of like atheism without actually saying yeah hey I think this is where I'm headed mm. and um yeah so we just sort of talked and I just said look this is a decision that I've made and it's all quite blurry now but yeah we sort mm-hmm. of ended the phone call I got to my friend's house and um yeah I think the next year really was just me putting in place like the practical measures for me to Mm -hmm. start my life again Mm -hmm. um and to do that I really needed to I guess isolate myself from Mm -hmm. my family yeah so in that sense like I I really chose to push them to one side and Mm -hmm. just sort of go look, it's nice that you guys want to still contact me. So my, my mum was trying to, like, stay in contact and, you know, she'd want to call and she wanted me to come and visit and all of this sort of stuff. And I just thought, look, I have no idea how, I guess, yeah, like where I'm going from here mm-hmm. and I need to decide that without the pressure of your expectations and how you're going to feel about um, my decision about the religion so look I'm just really going to minimize contacts for a while mm-hmm. um, you know feel free to message me when you want and I'll reply when, when I can mm-hmm. so like I was and like I didn't do that easily like there was a lot of guilt in doing that um, particularly since I've been like really close to my mum mm-hmm. um, growing up and we talked about everything and we were each other's support person and I, I really felt like I was betraying her and, um, yeah, that I was just being unforgivably selfish. But at the same time, mm-hmm. it's absolutely what I needed to do to survive. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I just really focused on myself, like getting a job, finding um, somewhere to live and just starting to experience um, yeah. my new life. and. Um, yeah, so part of, uh, with all of that, you know, as I was feeling like I was really succeeding with my life after Islam, um, I was still really battling the, the family guilt and also the the stigma of apostasy was something that I'd really internalised. Mm-hmm. Um, because even though, like, I'd gone through all of that work to break apart the foundations of my Islamic beliefs and I'd made a calculated decision to leave based on logic. Um, I guess there was no efficient way to process that from an emotional perspective. It was just mm-hmm. something that needed to come apart on its own. Yeah. And the indoctrination with Salafis is is particularly strong. You know, there's a mm-hmm. lot of mind games. There's, you know, years of feeling like you're corrupted, you know, like you're dirty, you're immoral. Mm-hmm you're weak for letting yourself doubt first of all and then letting those doubts get to the point where you're disbelieving um you know like disbelief is just such a dirty concept um you know within Islam it's there's such a strong narrative around um you know the like Muslims versus non-Muslims that sort of binary is is everywhere throughout the scripture and when you look at um even the seer and the prophet's stories and all this stuff that we were um, fed from, you know, a, a young age, even at bedtime. And, and glory, an and it was, a lot of it was glorified. So it was really hard to doubt that it was wrong. Exactly. It, it was all like, was. you're a good person for doing this and this is how you should be doing. And there was this um, object- objective morality that was imposed on you. Um, in terms of like hating homosexuals, and I'm like, I couldn't, I couldn't get myself to do it. Mm. And that was like the easiest way to go. Like, no, nah, I don't agree with you. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's how it it ended up being um, at the beginning. But yeah, I think there was just so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was just so much propaganda that built up mm-hmm. over years and years, and it was just really hard to like eradicate, I guess, every part of that. And so there was a lot of it that was still lingering even after I'd made 
the decision to leave. And yeah. um yeah, I just yeah, I felt like I'd made a really insane decision, even though in my conscious life, like as I was participating in my new life, I was so happy. But deep down I just had this weight that I was carrying around. And um it it wasn't until I actually started um I guess engaging with the ex-Muslim movement that I realized mm-hmm. that that weight was like shame and guilt around leaving a son and like just to hearing other people that had um, like particularly, you know, Yaz Muhammad, mm-hmm. when she talks about how long that um, indoctrination, like how long it's taken for her to break through that indoctrination and how that's actually taken like trauma therapy to, mm-hmm. to work through. Um, obviously she has been through a lot of trauma as well in you know individual story but um I think yeah just being like coming across content that validated my experience like like, all my non-muslim friends validated me they didn't give two shits that I wasn't Muslim obviously they were just like cool let's move on um yeah but I needed someone to know what it meant to be Muslim and then know what it meant to leave it to sort of go that's okay like that's a completely rational ethical moral decision and you're not just a product of satan yeah having led you astray because those thoughts were still subconsciously running through my mind because i believed that for so long um that disbelievers were just a product of um you know satan um victorious in his sworn mission to lead every human yeah being astray so um but what's interesting is that like it took me two and a half years after leaving to even find the ex-muslim movement i i was so ashamed of my apostasy yeah. that i didn't even reach out for support i didn't even look for the content because mm-hmm. i couldn't even almost couldn't even form the words to type into google like to even yeah. write like you know, do people leave Islam, um, yeah. you know, people that have left Islam, like whatever way you'd describe it. To me, it was just so insane that, of course, like other people aren't doing it readily yeah. and, of course, they're not talking about it. Um, and, yeah, I think it's really striking that, like, I know, like, Yasmin's talked a lot about um, how isolated she felt when she went through this whole process and, how happy she is that we like like the newer apostates have so much support Mm -hmm. and how far that's all come but I can't help I guess feeling really um I think still feeling really devastated the fact that you know all that support was available to me but I didn't find it because I was still so indoctrinated and so at the mercy of that indoctrination after leaving that I wasn't able to like mentally and you know emotionally find those connections or or form those connections with other people yeah and there's millions of people that feel exactly the same way like yeah there are a lot of new ex-muslims who are just scared of confronting it and it's painful sorry so many closeted um yeah um ex-muslims is just absolutely insane to me and we're all here making the same exact choice and we're just as terrified by it you know whether we're in the west or in muslim majority countries whether you know we have access to the online Mm -hmm. material or whether we don't we're still struggling with it so much and i think that really speaks to um yeah how huge of a stigma apostasy is in um muslim communities and that's that's the root of all of these issues Mm -hmm. it's crazy yeah yeah it is I mean I feel like there are a lot of women as well that I work with and they're not ready to even confront it um and they're like oh yeah I agree with you or um my religion is not going to change even if I don't wear a hijab or something and a lot of the sexism and the misogyny they agree with me Mm -hmm. um but they're not ready to go there and they're not yeah. ready to seek help as well, um, which is why I feel like 
a lot of the times, like um, the Discord channel that we have for Faithless Ajabi, a lot of the girls come and, you know, all of their stories are just like, it's relatable by other people. But it mm -hmm. took them such a long time to get there, to even confront it to themselves. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of, like, I have a few ex-Muslim friends who still, um, oh, is my screen frozen? Uh, am I am I throughout this? Sorry, I don't I said something. No, no, no. It's a lot. Oh, okay. Give me give me a minute. Give me a minute. Okay. I'll I'll be back. Hi guys, how's it going? <laughs> um, send your questions through if you have any. What does Zara usually say when there's a break? Um, hmm. I'm going blank. Hi. Ah, hello. Hi, I just, I, I don't know if this is better, but I just exited. Yeah, I just, I just connected wired. Um, so I had to get up and do it. Sorry about that. I, did, I didn't know how blurry it was until I saw the YouTube channel. I'm like, maybe that is just me being crazy about it. Oh, so yeah, I wasn't sure if that was my connection. That was blurring you out. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's all, no, I, that's what I thought. I'm like, is it? Is it my God? but yeah okay it looks better it's now better. Yeah, yeah, yeah oh wow okay well lesson learned um yeah <laughs> so let Zara know if she's <laughs> yes <blurry. laughs> Zara usually sings yeah a lot of singing <laughs> do I? I I actually hate singing um I was saying um Okay, I'm um, like was trying to like fill in the time while you were going. Oh, I like, oh, usually say if there's an interruption, I genuinely just could not think of anything, so I was just silent. The Zara, you should... I think that's what the, the response. Was. I was like, yeah, yeah, I sing. You should do it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, you're you're right. There, there is still a lot of guilt attached to it. There's a lot of trauma. There's a lot of self blame. There is mm. still especially when you've newly left and you know you're like oh this didn't work out for me maybe i should have just stayed in islam and i think just bringing yourself back to it um and you've usually like we have we have questions in five minutes um i just wanted to kind of bring this up so i guess you know given that whole journey with your family you're now in good contact with them um you you have a positive relationship or it's building up to be tell us a little more a little bit more about that yeah so it it got to a point um I think it was about a year ago that I sort of there was just sort of this intermittent contact so I was still had my walls pretty firmly in mm -hmm. place and my mum was constantly yeah, inviting me over and saying hey your uncle's coming this weekend or this person's coming why don't you join us for dinner or whatever and I just thought oh she has no idea what my reservations are like we just need to have an honest conversation about what mm -hmm. my concerns are what I'm afraid of mm -hmm. about this relationship and so I, I called her up and I said look I'm an atheist I feel like mm -hmm. you know that mm -hmm. I have tried to say that to you in the past. when was that um, I think about a year ago uh-huh um and um, yeah, so I sort of just said it bluntly and was like, I'm really concerned that you only want to continue this relationship because you're, you've you been thinking I'm still Muslim all of this time or that you thought that um, there's the potential for that going forward and you're just trying to keep contact so that you have an avenue to continue influencing me down this path. So mm -hmm. I just want to assert that this is what my beliefs are and I really don't see that changing anytime mm -hmm. soon is that you know a um a reality that you can mm -hmm. um see us con conducting a relationship with it and um she said yeah like we've known forever like and I said does my dad know because he's the one that I was 
most concerned about the entire yeah. time. Um, because even though all Salafi is, you know, he's the like Salafi OG, like he was yeah. really, really into yeah. about it all. So, um, um, and he's the one that actually, like, he has. So you know, there's there's a, a particular belief within Islam that uh, a person who doesn't pray is also an apostate. So you can't be a Muslim without praying, yeah. and um, so you have to treat them as though they've left Islam. And um, he he genuinely did shun this person because he thought, mm-hmm. like, I, I can't be around them. Like that's to the level that he was practicing yeah. it. Um, and obviously, like, the, the death penalty doesn't come into it in that situation because the guy wasn't saying he was an apostate. He was just not mm-hmm. praying. And so in my mind, I thought, oh, look, he, he could do anything. I don't know what he believes. Mm-hmm. And so I said to her, like, does he know? And then um, she said, yeah, he's known. We've talked about it. And I've tried to sort of bring it up in conversation as sort of easily as I can mm-hmm. and ease him into that um, sort of that reality and I said, "Well, tell me exactly what he said because I don't, yeah. um, I don't believe that that could be true. Yeah. Like that's yeah. just not the the man that I knew." And so I was just sort of asking her questions like that, sort of just being like, letting her know, "Look, I'm really afraid of that. There's two realities at play here, and that we're not on the same page. And I'm not going to be able to let my walls down until you know where I'm at, and I know where you're at. So let's mm-hmm. just, you know, yeah, have this frank conversation." And, um, yeah, by the end of it, like, she really reassured me of a lot of the things that I'd had, like, hidden, um, Mm -hmm. like, sort of underlying doubts about. And then, um, so, yeah, I think we were, like, on much better terms after that. But what really brought us together was, um, you know, I had a surgery uh, just, like, four and a half months ago. and. I really needed some help with it. Like I needed somewhere to stay afterwards. And I also needed like a little bit of money um, Mm -hmm. to just sort of make it over the line because I was doing it privately. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really like asking for it, but I was just sort of letting them know, like this is what the situation is. And Mm -hmm. they were like, yes, like we've actually, you know, we've known that this was going to be an option for you to get the surgery for a while. We really want to help you out with it. That's awesome. um, yeah, like we're happy to obviously open up our homes and nurse you back to health sort of thing. And um, I think that was like really symbolic for me. I think that yeah. was the moment that the rest of my doubts sort of disappeared because yeah. it's really symbolic when your family is like willing to – like it's, it's – Support. Weird, like, yeah. like financial supporting mm-hmm. – like financially supporting something – that's part of my new life mm-hmm. it was really meaningful to me because my dad has always said that um, he wouldn't support someone doing something that he disagreed with because then he'd be complicit. Mm-hmm. So um, like earlier on in the relationship, I'd um, wanted to, I'd moved and I was just telling them in passing and my mom said, Oh, look, your dad's really conflicted. He wants to help you move. But, because he doesn't agree with you living outside of the home, um, he feels like he's going to be complicit in that sin. Mm-hmm. So he, he can't help you. So that was something that was real progress yeah. for him particularly. And um, I knew how much that meant Yeah, that he was and, willing to support me. And were you surprised? Yeah, yeah. I was blown away. Like I just couldn't – yeah, I think like – yeah, make, you make a lot yeah. of assumptions mm-hmm. in your own mind um, based on your worst fears and yeah. you wanting to protect yourself from further upheaval. Um, yeah. And, um, Can I just give people a background on our first disagreement about families? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there was a time we were in a group chat and we were talking about um, conditional love from families with apostates. And I'm like, yeah, I agree there is a conditional love there, but I still think that, you know, because because I've had a positive experience and just like Omeima, I had to go away for a bit and find myself, but then I came back and there there is a lot of emotional guilt still to it. There are a lot of actions I don't accept they do and they don't accept I do, but we just 
you know, sweep it under the rug. So at the time, Umayma and I were talking about this and I was like, I think that maybe in the future, there's always um, a room for negotiation with your family and that eventually, you know, they will value you because you've been a big part of their lives. And um, I was very positive and I'm still, and you know, sometimes when I got knocked back, um, I would remember Umayma's words. I, I I don't think I've told you, but Umayma went like, you know, um, do you want to repeat what you said? But it was it was around, you know, I know, I know so, the sentiments that we yeah. Discussed. So it was around like, you know, it's like I would not like I don't want a relationship with them if they're going to be toxic and conditional. Um, mm. And it was more around, you know, you don't need a family and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I agree with you because I've had closer friends. But I'm like, I still feel like a lot of us, because we've grown up with that, we just have that connection with our families that is not um, repairable by a lot of people. And I think a little devil now, now um, talking to her family, but very little. So I was, uh, when Umema told me she started talking to her family, I was like, what? Because I used to, whenever I was back down by my family, I was like, maybe they don't really love me. And then all I had to do was just take all. And oh. and there are times where they like, you know, I feel like love is such a complex thing, even with our families, that yeah. there's, you, it's really hard to differentiate yourself with um, an identity that others see you with. So... Mm. I feel like if I'm talking to my family, I can't just talk to them as them being my family, but I also know that they're Muslim. So there are some things I can't tell them or there are some things that will upset them and that, you know, um, there it's so hard sometimes for me to not be this person that I am because I'm so passionate about these topics. So whenever mm -hmm. things like, you know, the protests in London come up or anything um, that is remotely political or personal as well, or like, you know, when, when we were playing a quiz and they put some old music on or some old movies and I'm like, by the way, guys, I haven't, I the first time I heard music was when I was 12. So like, you know, people are still surprised and that is such a me part. It's really hard to like, just keep quiet at it. Mm -hmm. So there are things like that, that I just cannot separate. Yeah. And when I talk to my family and, you know, when they talk about my niece, let's say, passing a grade or something, I'm just, and they say, mashallah, and I'm like, you know, mashallah, may Allah help her succeed. And I'm like, mm hmm I, th I think, I think, I think she was just really smart or yeah. like, you know, I like, it's all her and it's so hard sometimes, but I just have to like bite my tongue and go like, you have good intentions. That's all that matters. But then it kind of hurts me to see that not enough praise is going out there to the person actually doing the work. Mm. Um, so I figured like that was, that was our, I wouldn't say clash, but that was our differences. And I was like, and there was a lot for me to think about as well, because I also held my family to a standard where they will always accept my activism, even if I blaspheme. And the reality is that they have their reservations about it. Mm. Um, just like I do about what they do. So yeah. I'm really, I guess I'm really glad to see that, you know, that there are still ex-Muslims who champion for that relationship and that I hope, mm -hmm. and I know that won't be the case with a lot of ex-Muslims, um, but, you know, I, I do hope that people are eventually able to um, find, find, like, fill that void up because there's, there's always a void that your family doesn't care and I did that with a lot of my friends. So find really good friends, uh, yeah. part of the ex-Muslim community as well, where I met Ubema. Um, and I was like, oh, I, what, I, I think the first time was like, I invited you over to my house. Yeah, well, I think we I, I, through Faithless Hijabi. Yeah, and I was like, oh, do you just want to come over? <laughs> yeah, it was A to B. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, so you're, I was like, you're an ex-Muslim and you're a woman amazing <laughs> i was just like this come over i'm like i have drinks <laughs> yeah there's a lot of trust but as you as you've said you've pointed out like there's a lot of trauma bonding that yeah. goes on and i just feel like you know we were sitting there like just doing our makeup that afternoon and just sharing such intimate details about our I lives know. and then we went out drinking different. yeah 
<laughs> and um, it's it's a really yeah, very unique relationship. Yeah, um, I definitely felt a lot safer. Yeah. For some reason, I just felt like I felt like home. So when I talk yeah. to ex Muslim women, I feel like I'm at home. Um, yeah, and we can like you know, as you've said, like you came from a completely different background, mm-hmm. but there's like of Islam, but there's something just so like you just connect on a spiritual mm-hmm. level. I don't know, even though I don't. Yeah, really yeah, I. Really, but there was a lot of abstract way. Yeah, and I and I and I really like it, and it was just like for me, it was more like this is my shelter, this is my home. Um, mm. And when I met, and every time when I meet ex-Muslims, and I've done this, like like right now I have a bit of tears, but every time I speak to ex-Muslims on the life after Islam, I'm like, I'm always really teary because I'm like, oh my God, look at you, so brave. Um, nice. Yeah, I know, and I'm just like, what I, I still remember that night and we went out and I know where we went as well, um, but we were just chilling. And then, yeah. it, and and I think you also slept over as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was the first time we met. <laughs> that was a. <laughs> it's 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 also how I recruit for Faithless Hijabi as well. Yeah. Um, I was like, I'm gonna take you out for drinks, so I know who you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I'll train you in the morning. <laughs> and then and then I'll t- I'll tell you everything about it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty um, effective. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's I. I guess for me to get to know somebody, like I have learned one thing that you know in my recent years, not just explicit, like to be vulnerable. Because after I left, I was so guarded yeah, and protected. Yeah. I was like, I don't want to talk to anyone. I don't want to share my life with anyone because you're just going to hurt me. Because if my family can do it, or if other Muslims can do it, like a lot of my Muslim friends, I think the moment I told them I was ex-Muslim, I suddenly turned into a demon. I suddenly, like, for a lot of them, they were like, no. Nah. And I'm like, what? You've known me for 11 years. Yeah, yeah. And um, one of my best friends, and, you know, we never had a fight or anything. She unfollowed me on Instagram, and that's when I knew this is over because that was the only way we were in touch. And I think for her, um, I had known her for so long, and then I hadn't met her for seven years, and I went and I met her in Dubai. And it was, you know, it was, it was interesting because um, I went in, because she said something like, oh, and inshallah, who knows, you'll come back to Islam. And I'm like, I just didn't know what to say. I just didn't know what to say. This is like three years ago. So I was like, I, and it was still really new and I wasn't an activist. And I was like, I don't know how to comprehend this. I don't, I don't want to offend you because you're my friend and I get that, but, you know, it just felt like there was some hope that I'd once been a Muslim that I would probably come back. Um, and, you know, what like... It, what it means to her. Like, it's like... I don't know. That's the only way that you can share a connection. Yeah. You have this one thing in common. And yeah. it's just really sad that that overrides just a human connection. Yeah. It is so like... Places. When, when I met her, I was like, yeah, you know, we've been friends. And, you know, I was like, yep, doesn't matter. We just don't have to talk about religion. And that's okay. And, like, I already, because she's married and has a kid, um, I already knew that, you know, she's not going to be an ex-Muslim. There's no way mm-hmm. somebody just, like, and she's really, really smart as well. So, for me, I was just like, eh, you're still my friend. It didn't matter because I was like, well, it doesn't matter. Like, even if you believe and, like, I meet people like at work and sometimes they're Christians and Hindus and I'm like, don't really care. Like for me, it doesn't matter. But it's always been the other way around where I had a Muslim coworker who went like, and I told him about what we do with Faithless Hijabi, like giving women the space to talk about it or helping them or even just getting them out of abusive houses. And he went like, I remember a coworker actually said, oh, I'm going to do the opposite of what your charity does and convert people to Islam and bring them closer and whatnot. And like in my head, and I'm like, how did this become a competition? It was not even about you. Yeah. I don't I don't proselytize. It was like, for me, it's mostly about, are you okay? And you could remain yeah, to be yeah. a Muslim. And, you can, and I have had people who've remained Muslims and I'm like, I don't care. Um, the reason you came and opened up about your mental health and your doubts was because you couldn't tell anybody in your community who was Muslim because they would judge you. And I'm not going to be the same person. 
Yeah, it's it's not about convincing people to feel a certain way. It's about yeah. validating them when they do. Yeah, exactly. It's that simple. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I remember, like, I have a lot of, because Instagram has a lot of young people who post up photos and like photos and have use it for chat as compared to Twitter and Facebook. I have a lot of, like, young British-born Pakistanis or Bangladeshis always attacking me. And then I would just ask them a question. And I'm like, have you read your books? And they're like, yeah, I have. And I'm like, what do you think about this? And then they were like, they didn't have, they didn't know what to say. Or, you know, I, I felt like I cornered them with a lot of facts. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to give you your space for three months. Um, how about you think about it? And then let's talk about it later. And I'm happy if we disagree, but it would be nice to see how two people can disagree on similar experiences or seeing the same story. And I think that was that was taken in better than like me saying, you're wrong and that you yeah, should be yeah. us. Um, I, like if they come out, fine. If they don't come out, that's okay too. Um, but I guess without delaying it, there were a few questions for you um, and I hope we can, yeah, okay, cool. Um, there was somebody praising Jesus here and he wanted you to know that Jesus loves you. Um, Jesus. Yeah. Um, somebody has a few, have a cute few comments when we're talking about hijab. Um, hijab is modest to culture men telling women to cover up so their property is safe and clean to consume for them. Um, and that. yeah, there was, there's a lot of control and then, we were talking about the West and modesty culture, not not modesty culture in the West, but mostly like women feeling um, attacked by being by covering up. So um, that was one. Um, and then there is why does a movement have to be modest at all? I think these were like people in the chat, but this one's this one's directly for us. What is your explanation? why Islamic world is holding on to women, oppressing and excluding them from community, contributing to um, the development of the society. Mm. So I think, I think with me is that I feel like I've always felt, and I could be very wrong, that women hold a lot of the power in obviously patriarchal societies and spe specifically with religion because, you know, because there's a systematic sense of control that is imposed on women, if you give them the power to go out of it, there's no more power you can hold over an entire group of people. Yeah. And that's why I've always felt like if women stood up for themselves, or if women just started rejecting these ideas, or if, imagine if we're in a nation where Iran is like, no more forced hijabs, and like 80% of the women, or even let's say 40% of the women remove their hijabs. And men are like, what? You know, it's, yeah, it's exactly. everybody's like, you know, that will, that will be a domino effect on other women removing it as well. And, mm -hmm. you know, all the men now going, you know, all the men now not understanding that, what do we do? Because we're seeing women's skin. Um, so I feel like women, the more you empower women, the more, um, the less restricted um, a society can be, and yeah. the more progress, the pro more progression they can bring about. Yeah, and I think progress introduces uncertainty, mm -hmm. and I think when you've had that certainty of your God-given place in mm -hmm. society um, and having like respect just awarded mm -hmm. to you, you're not going to want to shake shake that society up um you know at the end of the day like yeah I don't I don't know if there's much motivation to yeah to change the society um yeah. f for men because it's yeah just um yeah you don't you don't actually have to earn your respect and your power in, in a patriarchal society it, it's given to you and um, when everyone's controlled so um, so much, it's yeah easy to predict what's going to happen and easy to sort of manipulate outcomes and 
it, a society appears to be functioning mm -hmm. well, even though there's a lot of, um, you know, dis discontent on yeah. among individuals. My my dad sent me a photo of this woman being a judge in the UK. It was mm -hmm. just quite recent. And then I'm like, yeah, that's because she's in the UK, that she has many opportunities that, you know, and she's a hijabi woman. And I'm like, I'm sure there are other Muslim women who don't wear hijab who have also reached quite a high set status mm -hmm. and other women in general. So it's not the West that's discriminating. Yeah, it's it's not the West discriminating. It's a lot of the Muslim majority countries that discriminate against women. So I actually, and I'm like, this is amazing. I love that there is representation. Now let's do it in the Muslim majority countries. Yeah, and he just didn't know what to reply. Yeah, yeah. Um, Flan yeah. Infidel asked a question. So this is a question I always ask before I end the podcast anyway. Um, so you can answer it now. And then there are two other questions after this. Um, what advice would you give to young ex-Muslims, young teenagers, and is there anything we can do to support um, young ex-Muslims, younger ex-Muslims? Mm. Um, I think it, it's it's difficult because so much is circumstantial. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for me, my advice is to value yourself and your life and your priorities um, above everything else and feel tr like try and accept the fact that to reclaim your freedoms you might have to be selfish for a short amount of time and I think for Muslims um who you know are raised especially within like it's compounded within certain cultures but you know, as you've said mm -hmm. um there's that feeling of um a debt that you're owed to your family and that you owe to your society and um turning your back on them in order to pursue your own goals can feel so counterintuitive um, and just feel really damaging to someone's um, perception of themselves. So I think uh, like a lot of people find it hard to be selfish. And I think that's something that a lot of ex-Muslims need to do to mm -hmm. um, number one, establish boundaries and yeah. with, with people. Um, I think you need to be really assertive about what you need, um, especially as early as possible. Um, and yeah, just think, think about your own needs. And then the other thing is like, try and accumulate as many resources and support net networks, um, as you can before you take any sort of drastic action. Like I didn't necessarily have a plan when I left, but mm -hmm. I did, I had a support network, which was um, my non-Muslim friends and I had savings and I also yeah. had a, a job history. So that yeah. made it easy for me to get a job on the outs when I left. Financial independency is key it's to crucial. coming out. It is it is so crucial. And mm -hmm. the one advice I would always give to younger ex-Muslims is build yourself up for that. Always, yeah. always build yourself up for that. You do not shelters are great if you're in a Western world, but you know, just having that. Um, independency and being able to get a job if you had to change country is is amazing and it really really and, helps yeah and like for a lot of people like that advice would be really frustrating because they might feel they might be in a situation where they're so restricted that yeah um they're like well how the hell do I do that but you know a lot of the things my approach to gaining independence steadily over the years was to arm myself with um, like knowledge from Islam and mm -hmm. try and find an, an angle that mm -hmm. would support me in in making these things work because a lot mm -hmm. of the restrictions that we face mm -hmm. as Muslim women they're not explicitly backed by the doctrine mm -hmm. um, they're, they're a, an indirect or they, they sort of yeah. like yeah like an, a run-on effect of um, attitudes that are um, produced by the doctrine which is still really um really um still a really big issue but there is ways of you know you can find certain sheikhs or certain sources that will help you yeah. argue your case to um family and, and try and find angles if you can yeah. to to support it and um you know try and come at it from an islamic perspective if you 
if you have to. It's yeah. it's what I it's what I did for my eyebrow piercing. I got it when I was a hijabi when I was seventeen and I was still wearing a scar. And you know, when I showed it to my family, they're like, you know, is it haram? And I'm like, I actually checked the scholars thing and they said if earrings are permitted, this is too provided you're not doing it to the intention to be attractive. And I'm like yeah. Well, I know my intention, and I'm telling you, it's not. Yeah, and I'm, and I, yeah, and I was like, and I wear a hijab, so I can always cover it if I wanted to. Um, but I remember when I went to Iran, you know, and like I used to wear a hijab, and it's it would show sometimes because I'm not going to cover my face, and it was right here. I think you had seen it because I removed it last year, and you know, some of them would go like, "Oh my God, this is so pretty," because they couldn't do it in Iran, and then some of them would go like, "It's haram," and I'm like, "No, that's not." <laughs> yeah yeah and i was like um sorry go ahead no go for it no that was it um yeah like with getting a job for example like the thing that was standing in my way like there's a number of things like um obviously you're having to interact with the opposite gender there's yeah. the issue of the uniform like if it's yeah. modest enough there's the issue of selling products that um are haram so like one mm -hmm. of the issues that i faced was like tobacco mm -hmm. or if you're working like um, selling people alcohol, um, obviously depending on how conservative your family is, is depending on whether that's yeah. concerned them. But also like selling pork and that sort of thing can be an issue. Um, and then also like whether you miss prayer. So like these were all things that I had to mm -hmm. sort of reassure um, my dad yeah. about. But so I guess, and then also the fact, I guess the, the overarching thing that reason that he didn't want me to get a job was because um, in a sum with the guardianship system uh, a man is meant to maintain his the women that um yeah yeah that sort of I guess answer to him and um he felt like you know we were subverting I guess that structure mm -hmm. and that in some ways that I guess he felt like I was challenging his role yeah in being the, the financial provider and so I just had to sort of find a way of explaining it that actually this was about me um reaching my goals and sort of I guess pursuing like personal growth mm -hmm. and, and development and it had nothing to do with the money it was just about um yeah like challenging myself and yeah uh, expanding my skill set and like see so everyone's going to be different with what, yeah. how they approach it but then you know he was like well what area of retail are you going to work in so then we found a, a space where I wasn't going to be selling anything that was, yeah. Um, so it's just going through point by point, like what yeah. the are and trying to refute them from mm -hmm. a perspective. But yeah, yeah, I think the key thing is, as you pointed, get a support network, get financial um, independence, and yeah. set boundaries for yourself. Yeah, um, we have so, two more questions before we end. So what benefits do women have within Islam or under Sharia law? Um, for the longest time, I thought that because women are made to be dependent on men, that is a positive. Um, well, the way they sell it to you is men are the head, like, you know, the head of the house. And, you know, if you earn money, you don't have to give it to your husband only um your yes, husband uh, on, on, only your husband has to pay for the house you don't have to do it exactly. so i guess under like if you if you don't think about it too closely it's all about um you know men controlling women or the society controlling women and my mother used to enforce that for me she's like you're why are you even studying like this was when i was 19 mm -hmm. and i was going to do my masters and she's like why are you even studying um you're gonna you're going to stay home and take care of the kids anyway and i was like watch yeah. me but this came from women as well oh, um absolutely. a lot of it was like this is what your role is in the family but what i guess what would you say are the benefits of women in islam under sharia um i think like some people um function quite well with conformity mm -hmm. um, you know, we're all different. Not everyone wants independence. Not everyone yeah. wants um, to be like have the steering wheel for their own mm -hmm. life. And so, if you're one of those people, like I think they're called like even not Islamic, but like the trad wives. Mm -hmm. Like there are people that choose to 
um, you know, be submissive and choose to, um, I guess, live a life where mm-hmm. they're completely dependent on someone else and that's something that they find, um, what's the word, some sort of benefit. In. Um, so I guess for them, of, of course, I would never condone it because it's forced and mm-hmm. the, the way that it, that it exists within Islam is that women don't have the choice to do to do anything but that but yeah. I guess that's a selective benefit and maybe um that you don't have to engage in jihad so you never have to mm-hmm. go to battle <laughs> the, yeah you know, but, yeah. yeah I guess that is um but you are there to serve the men who go to jihad you should really okay. you should really watch that um tv show caliphate okay. yeah yeah it, where is that what's that Netflix on? Like, Netflix. Netflix. Yeah, because I in in that TV show, I also did a review for it for like half an hour, a live review, where I was like, the women, the women wanted to do it and they were treated as property. That was evident from like episode one. Mm -hmm. The way they're like, Well, if you die, you'll be married off to another jihadi, or like, you know, well, at least if she dies, she can be my wife, or like, um it's yeah, like like ISIS was sold to other women as like paradise. Um, yeah. Can Islam be reformed like Christianity? If yes, which doctrine of Islam do you think will be the hardest to reform? I think Salafi. Uh, yeah, definitely. So the the literalist um, branch of Islam is going to be difficult because yeah. you would have to actually rewrite the doctrine since that's yeah. what they use as evidence. There's no um, reinterpretation that happens there. There's no other influences that go into how um, Islam is practiced in sal- Salafism. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, you'd actually have to eliminate verses and yeah. possibly introduce new ones. Um, I don't know how that would work since... There's so many different interpretations of that as well. And people would not agree on like what other people think what child marriage is. They don't necessarily agree that it is child marriage. Yeah. Like rules like that, like those hard coded things that are clearly wrong for many people, some people will still justify because then they would have to admit that Muhammad was wrong. Yeah, and I, I think um, it's just not comparable to Christianity because they have a central authority that can um, sanction changes. And they can say, like, they're, they're cons- like, the, the authorities in Christianity are considered divine enough to make these decisions mm-hmm. on behalf of God, like they're acting on God's will. Yeah. And so anyone that follows these changes or implements these changes has absolutely no worries about what the effects of that are going to be because they know that someone mm-hmm. else is taking responsibility for that. Um, the same can't be said for a son where everyone's super like they're, you're on your own. Um, it's up to you to find the correct interpretation. Yeah. It's up to you to worship as much as you see fit and um, to stay as true as you, you see fit. Like, of the yeah. Country. So um, I think the fact that it's so individual yeah. um, while being troubled at the same time, so it's very weird. Um very weird phenomena but yeah i i don't have much hope for it because i think no. Salafism is the 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 root that keeps it fixed on the doctrine and Salafism rejects any form of innovation so it just i don't know i think it, it Salafism is always going to be around and we've seen throughout history that yeah. liberal interpretations of islam have come through and even like culturally, like in, in Egypt and like every Muslim majority country, there's stages where the majority of the population aren't religious at all and they're just culturally Muslim. Mm-hmm. But then another wave will come through to bring Salafism back or some sort of hardcore um, interpretation. So I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't believe in reformation as well. But with that, we will end this here and Umayma will be joining us on um, 
our feminism series, which is which we're still deciding will be about a three part series, answering a lot of your not not questions and not just answering stuff, but also like addressing different points of views with somebody else. And we're just going to have a three women panel on feminism and um, let us know if you have any questions for Umayma, you can find her on Twitter. And I don't think you use Facebook, do you? Uh, not really. Yeah. That's just to connect with high school friends. Twitter yeah. Is sort of where it's at now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I have linked her profile on the description. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Stay for a bit. Um,